Joining us on The Informer is a behavioural analyst, someone I've been looking forward to having a talk to for quite some time. His name is Steve Van Apperen. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Um, I work for myself, uh, yeah. but I do consult my services to different police departments around Australia. Now, you've been uh, a member of the force for quite some time. Um, in those early days, I think you were in South Australia? Police South, Australia, in South Australia and Victoria. And Victoria. Uh, the, do, the two different jurisdictions, um, how far apart are they? Are they similar or are they the same? Pretty much the same, just uh, same laws, uh, just different acts of parliament and whatnot. So when I uh, went through the academy here, I had to go through the whole process again, mainly uh, procedural, arrest procedures, all that pretty much the same, but rules of evidence are the same. But uh, insofar as uh, particular legislation, um, pretty different, but same type of offences. So, you know, policing is policing, I guess, no matter where you go. Yes, but it's more than that for you, because uh, you've spent quite some time overseas, uh, you've done an awful lot of uh, profiling work these days uh, and you, you're using it to help uh, a number of different cases. Uh, what, are, what have been some of the experiences that you've enjoyed the most and have given you this unique platform that you work in uh, today? I remember probably there have been a number of satisfying uh, cases I've worked on, but one in particular was the murder of Bonnie Clark which was a, um, a young six-year-old girl. And um, when I was first contacted by the homicide squad, they said, look, we've got a case. We, um, they briefed me and they, certain members of the crew, one particular crew, believed that uh, Bonnie's mother was responsible for the death. Um, and I remember having conversations and um, some of the detectives said, you know, look, um, she was sexually assaulted and some believed that it may have been the mother. And now statistically, it's very rare for a mother to sexually abuse her offspring, physically, maybe sexually unusual. Mm. Um, but they, they had tunnel vision, some of these detectives. So I went down there and interviewed her. And my background is behavioural analysis interviewing uh, and detecting deception through verbal, nonverbal paralinguistic behaviours. So mm -hmm. typically, um, interviewing, good interviewers, uh, know how to read people, how to build a rapport, but also how to ask the right questions, but also not just simply be question askers, but analysts of human behaviour, understand why people do what they do from a psychology uh, basis. And um, anyway, I walked out of that interview, there was no doubt in my mind she was not involved. And I she remember wasn't involved. Wasn't, wasn't okay. involved. And I remember driving back to Melbourne with some of the detectives and they said, you know, giving me a bit of a ribbing, oh, we think you've got it wrong. I said, no, look, you know, there were a number of things that I looked for that were, were not there. Mm. Because sometimes when we interview people, we are um, uh, sometimes influenced by the personality or the person uh, that we're interviewing. Um, and going back, I've interviewed a, a clinically diagnosed psychopath, and he's like your typical grandfather. You, you wouldn't think that he could hurt a, a fly. Was it the appearance that drew, drew or would draw most people to say he wouldn't, he wouldn't hurt a fly? Absolutely, absolutely. But, but we don't know the personality behind that. And like we were talking before, I mean, you know, uh, conmen are very uh, proficient at what they do because they, they tap in to that particular emotion, what may it be, greed. You know, conmen can promise you, you know, 350% return on investment. And we think that sounds ridiculous, but he can actually, um, you know, Find go through the motions and convince you that what he's saying is true. Finds some plausible link that draws you in. Over the years, especially in my time on air, one of the cases that just wouldn't go away was the Azaria Chamberlain no. story. What did you make of that? Did you, you would have been a much younger man. Uh, your initial views, was it Lindy Chamberlain or was it the dingo? What was yeah, your look, initial fear? Oh, sorry, outcome, not, not later. I, you know, it's interesting because um, one of the things I do for police departments is analyse records of interview, uh, witness statements, all that type of yep. thing. And just more recently, I worked on the uh, Peter Falconio. Oh, I was going to say, uh, that was the next question. And um, what I found really interesting um, is that when you analyse, uh, you know, uh, a statement, if, if I was to ask you what you did this morning, Neurologically, you recall memory yep. through sensory input. Yep. So when and you're telling... I'd run you through like a timeline of what I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, from a behavioural analysis interview, let's just say I'm interviewing you for a homicide and you're a suspect. And we know a forensic pathologist has established the cause of death of the victim 7.15pm last night. Right, right. Now, I don't care how well rehearsed you are. You cannot possibly pre-anticipate every question that I'm likely to ask you. Mm. So... 
I might ask you, uh, where were you between, I don't know, 5 and 10 p.m. Mm. I went out. Where did you go mm. to a restaurant? Mm. What was the name of the restaurant? Have you mm. been there before? Mm. What mm. route did you take? How did, what time did you leave? What time did you get there? Describe the restaurant was on the menu. What did you eat? How did you pay for it? That takes a lot of cognitive processing. And for every one lie we tell, we have to invent two or three to protect ourselves from the first one. So we've, not only do we have to have a great memory, we want to make sure we haven't con uh, contradicted what we've previously said. Now, from what I saw with um, uh, Lindy Chamberlain, it's interesting because truthful per people's version of events very rarely change a la um, the, um, uh, in relation to, um, oh, what's the case, uh, Madeleine McCann. Oh, yes. Now, yes. if you listen to them, a number of things happen. Never once have they ever talked or spoken in past tense. Now, if you interview um, a parent who's had their child abducted, they will never ever talk in singular person past tense. They'll always talk in present in tense. The present. Why? Because the anticipation or expectation is yeah. their child will be returned alive, safe and well. Right. And I've seen cases, worked on cases where, um, or there's one in America, uh, Susan Smith, and she said, you know, I, I loved my children. There was, uh -huh. never, there was nothing I would do to hurt them. Now, when she said loved, that's past tense. Past tense. Later on, we found out that she was having an affair with a much younger man and he wouldn't accept her children, so she put them in a car, drove them into a dam where the three uh, or two children drowned. So the reason she was talking past tense because she knew. Yeah. And we had a similar occurrence in Australia with the Farquharson children. I know the case uh, well. Again, again, uh, it took an inordinate amount of uh, space in the media and uh, the, we got the full gamut of responses from the community too because everyone is a... Uh, behavioural analyst these days. We've watched so many television shows. Hollywood has much to answer for. Yeah. Um, what, what do you make of some of the um, programs that have run the gun and have uh, been uh, well received? Um, do they give you inkling of something that uh, you know is reasonable and fair or are they way off the mark? What do they give you tidbits? Just enough to make it plausible. Yeah, look, I, I remember uh, Silence of the Lambs when oh. that first came out oh, and yeah. profiling. And look, I think profiling has application and utility. Mm. The problem is, and I saw this with the Claremont serial killer investigation in Perth, um, part of the profile said the killer was fastidious about keeping his car clean. Well, I put to you, if you're going to transport a body in the back of your car, you're going to be fastidious about cleaning out any biological trace evidence that could connect you to the crime. So, I mean, I could go to a crime scene and you make a number of observations at a crime scene. I can tell whether or not the offender spent time with the victim post-mortem, has the scene been staged, has the body been moved, all those type of things, you know, blood in motion, there's all sorts of things mm. that you can. So I don't discount profiling, but the problem is it gives the public and investigators tunnel vision. I think it should be used holistically with other types of forensic, scientific and medical uh, approaches. But, uh, and also I remember when um, uh, Lie to Me come out, that, uh, that show, uh, and there is some basis in that. Uh, Professor Paul Ekman did a lot of work on micro-expressions yep. and distress signals. Yes, so the so-called tells that we, that we uh, see uh, uh, gamblers or uh, poker players play, the, the, the really good ones, yep. do assess not only the, the, the cards in your hand, but what you're telling me that you're holding. Mm. I mean, the really good ones uh, yeah. have that, that gift. No, is, it a, is it a gift or is it a, a, a series of life experiences uh, that has allowed them to acquire a, a, a forensic approach to identifying different things? Yeah, great question. Paul Ekman said there's a very small percentage of people who, ha who he calls wizards, who are really good at reading people. Now, I was running a training course for a company in um, uh, Hong Kong, and I show different videos of some homicide cases where they're interviewing offenders and witnesses. Mm -hmm. And there was one particular woman in that group who could pick them every time. And during a break, she said, oh, Steve, can I have a chat to you? I said, sure. And I, I had a suspicion, I didn't say at that stage, but I had a suspicion. And I said, um, tell me, have you had any uh, training or anything in reading? She said, no. But she could pick everyone, and it turns out later she admitted that from the age of seven to 13, she was sexually assaulted and abused by her stepfather. So what happened was, as a matter of survival, she'd become very adept at reading 
the grooming gestures and the preparatory gestures before wow. he was going to attack it. So wow. as a matter of survival and her safety, that's how she becomes so adept at reading people. But the problem is we listen to what people say and we take that into account and then we believe that may be the case. But the problem with that is, is uh, we get lied to on a daily basis. Mm. You know, think about all the things people lie. I mean, research shows, A, we're not very good liars, <laughs> and B, we think we're good at spotting them, but we're not. In fact, the research shows between 49 and 52%, so you might as well flick a coin. So what I teach people is how to look for several parameters, and that was verbal, non-verbal, body language, um, uh, paralinguistic style, that's the tone, pitch, rate, voice modulation, mm. response mm. latency, ums and ahs. And then we look for micro expressions, distress signals, hand to face masking, concealment, blocking behaviors. See, if I'm interviewing you and you start extracting yourself out of the narrative, the first thing I think is, well, hang on a minute. Why when I ask George that question, A, he didn't answer the question. There was uh, masking and blocking concealment behaviors. There was also changes in his uh, you know, positional responses. There was response latency. So holistically, we need to look for groups of things. Uh, you know, and a great example, let me ask you a question. What was your very first job? My very first job was working for my father. Actually, no, my very first job was uh, working for a friend of ours who had a jean shop in Bondi Junction. And I would have been about 15, 14, 15. Yep. Uh, and I, when I say a first job, paid job. So I was given uh, a salary for my working on Saturdays, Fridays and Saturdays, so Friday let, nights and Saturdays. Yeah. So let me ask you this question. Yeah. What did you just do with your body? What did I do with my body? Hmm. Um, you were so focused on telling me what the, the story was, yeah. you paid very little attention to what you were doing. Let me tell you what you were doing. Yeah. How many times have you heard people say, ah, he looked away, he must be lying. 80% mm -hmm. of the time in that response, you're looking down to your eye. Now, what you were doing with your fingers also changed when you were recalling information. So what the FBI teach uh, their agents is to benchmark and baseline a behavior, then look for deviations from that normative behavior. Got it. So loss of eye contact, is not indicative of deception because a lie by nature is where you willful, willfully mislead somebody knowing that what you're saying is factually incorrect. Mm. So loss of eye contact is not indicative of deception. So holistically, it goes to my point, we need to look for groups or clusters of behaviour and they may be uh, in the way that you say, but also in the way that you propel it. Because at the end of the day, your body uh, is responsible for you know, 60 to 70% of the nonverbal communication. And we have so many different ways of processing too. Um, of course, in the last few years, we've been asked to move away from the standard practices of the past, which were writing yep. and reading, to using devices. And some of those Absolutely. things that we learned in the past, we now have to somehow transition to a new way of, uh, of putting them together. So sometimes when I pause and look away, it's more like, which cog of my memory bank am I going to reach into yep. to identify the information I need in order to deliver it? Absolutely. Um, uh, and just on that point, yeah. too, when you're uh, thinking of what you're going to say, like just then, your obicularis oculi and zygomatic majors work together, which means it pulled the corner of your lips up, which is a genuine smile. So I believe people have lost the ability to read people. Why? Yes. Because we do it via text and emotion. We spend all our days doing this, looking down rather than looking at you. Absolutely. It's called engagement. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk more about engagement with Steve Van Apparen. Um, he's a behavioural specialist. He's been doing some remarkable work behind the scenes. We'll tell you more in part two of our conversation.